Hello and a very warm welcome to our session, Making Drupal Fly, Fly Through the Sky. Um, today we are going to present you um, the fastest Drupal ever. Uh, it's actually here now, um, where here means it's not just near or somewhere else, it's here in core, um, where we've built some very nice things um, that are making Drupal uh, fly and making it continue to fly. Um, but before we start, a little question to get to know you better as our audience. Um, who of you has been at the session in LA? Okay, most of you haven't seen that, that's good. Um, we still have some new things uh, for that. And um, who of you have been at the session for the CDNs yesterday? Oh, a lot more, okay, we sparked your interest. So there might be some overlap, but many things should be new to you as well. Okay, um, then we're gonna start. Um, my name is Fabian Franz, I'm from TechMon Consulting. We are performance and scalability experts, and uh, this is Wim Lears from Akia, and um, Akia has allowed us to um, focus working on that. I got some grants from the office of CTO and Wim uh, had been able to do that as part of his day job. Um, so let's start with a quote. I've installed Drupal, however it's running very, very slowly. Hitting the front page or clicking on a link such as administer can result in delays of 15 to 30 seconds. Uh, caching is enabled, by the way, and there's almost nothing in my installation. Very few users, very little content. Ah, oh, that's not so good. But actually, that's not Drupal 8. That's Drupal 4.7. Um, and then we have Drupal 5. Why is my Drupal site so slow? We have Drupal 6. Navigating between admin pages is slower than an arthritic snail. We have Drupal 7. Drupal 7 is unacceptable snow. So, uh, poor Drupal. Um, but what about Drupal 8? Will it be like a snail as well? The future is still open. <laughs> so the answer to all of that, and we got that via Twitter yesterday, is keep calm and cache. And actually, that's what Dries had done already a long time ago, and we just figured that out uh, this morning. Uh, page cache in Drupal 3.00. That was added in June 30, 2001. So this was kind of how the first um, Drupal, when the first page cache was added to Drupal, how it was, was looking like. And yeah, a lot has changed since then. So another trend we are seeing is, here we have a comparison of Drupal 4.7 with Drupal 5. And Dries in a blog post said, so generating a page in Drupal 5 is around 3% slower than in Drupal 4.7, but serving a cached page Drupal 5 is 73% faster and even 268% faster when the aggressive database cache is used. So um, uh, this is kind of an interesting thing we've seen again with Drupal 6, again with Drupal 7, um, that a Drupal has started to cache even more and more and has provided better performance for enterprise, etc. But this non-cache performance was always a little slower. And Drupal 4.7, by the way, looked like this then. So overall, we are starting to see a trend here. Let's see what we are getting. So Drupal 8, and that's me. And this is linking to this very same slide. So, and I say Drupal 8 is the fast Drupal ever. And you are like, what? The fastest Drupal ever? Are you serious? You are kidding, right? right, right. You must be kidding. But I thought Drupal 8 was slow. Everyone has told me that. It must be true. And besides that, page cache was already in Drupal 7, uh, I mean 3. <laughs> so page cache really does not count. Except it does, and Wim will show you later that it does. So let's take a look at a very short demo to show you how we can um, make a fastest Drupal ever. So um, this is actually um, the demo um, that Dries was almost to put in his keynote, but in the end it 
unfortunately didn't make it, but it's on the blog post there. So if you want to see it again once Dries' blog post comes out, um, it will be there. So um, the big pipe here is what Dries had said three times in his keynote, and uh, we'll take a look now how this will see. So we have personalized, slow, and cacheable content, what you've most listened to. Then there's personal, slow, and uncacheable content, what you're currently listening to. And then there's this comment form, which is even saying your name, like you're an avid music fan, etc. And now let's compare and stop. Oh, Big Pipe's already uh, finished. While traditional, we already still wait. Um, so, but what you might have seen um, when you were taking a close look was that for Big Pipe, that personalized, uncashionable blog was actually coming a little later. So, um, and this is kind of the trick on what Dries said in his keynote, um, that we are going from, we generate everything on the server and then send everything out to a kind of hybrid model where we are sending out whatever is ready and everything that is not ready, um, we are sending then. So that might have been a little confusing, a little fast. So let us take that more slowly overall and analyze that a little more. So I'm going to make that full screen, dismiss, and play. So this is our site, um, our today's site. Um, we're taking a look at this demo site and taking a long time. So yeah, maybe that's cache, that 2,440 milliseconds. Let's try again. Uh, it's not cache. So this really takes so long to render. Why is that? Uh, we have here, again, a very a block that's customized by user. So um, that would mean it is very hard to cache together with the URL. And we have a very dynamic timestamp that we have there. And then we have a lot of those commands. So and there's this awesome blog post that really is the content that I want you to see, that you, the comments are not that important. It doesn't matter if they come directly or if they come a little later, but that awesome blog post, that is what I want you to see. So now I've activated a strategy called single flash. And now we have kind of split up the page, and we're going to, in a bit more detail later, um, in time to deliver the page, which was 600 milliseconds now, and then flushing the placeholders, which takes around two seconds. And this was done by automatically placeholdering that content. But now if we reload, it gets a little faster, and then it gets even faster, even though if we are not yet seeing anything of that. But it says clearly on there that the time to deliver the page is just 31 milliseconds. And depending on how fast my server reacts, it can be like 26 milliseconds or even less. But the flushing placeholder time is always kind of slowing us down because what Drupal is doing, it's still completely um, generating all of that on the server and um, it's also completely generating all of those comments on the server directly and that means we have to wait those two seconds. But that's not what we want. We want people to see our awesome blog post directly and that's what we're going to do now. And what we're now um, activating is small pipe. So when we click now, then it's boom, directly there. And small pipe is a technology that compared to big pipe does not need JavaScript enabled. Uh, so it's completely transparent and maybe a better um, idea how to um, name it would be aggressive flush. What you are seeing is um, that uh, the time to deliver the page is really fast, like 28 milliseconds. And then this block with high Fabian is coming later. And the reason for that is because um, the dome order is like that, that first comes the content, then the comments, and then the sidebar. And um, with aggressive flush, we are kind of sending whatever we have ready. But if it comes early in the dome, we have to wait for it. And um, now we're going to, after testing that a few more times so that you can really see this block is coming later. But maybe it has information we want the user to directly see, and we just want the comments to come later because they're not that important to us. And now we've enabled Big Pipe, and that's now true. The block is almost immediately there. My awesome blog post is always there, and the comments come later. And if you pay close attention, you can even see the pager for a quick moment uh, before the rest of the uh, pages are there. 
And what's nice about that is that in Drupal 8 and with a big pipe, no one forces you to um, to have that like this, but you have all the possibilities uh, to do it. And yeah, there was a demo, um, a page delivered in just 28 milliseconds. <laughs> so what you just saw is generally a part of the mission to make the whole web fast. Not just Drupal, but the whole web. And that's a challenge by Wim Lears that I've taken on together with him. And everyone profits from this. So it's an ambitious goal. Let's see what, what does fast mean in this. Fast means the user should have a great user experience so that pages load fast for one user. But the, the, there should be also a great user experience so that pages load fast if there's several concurrent users. And the user experience should also be that the time to first byte, what you've just seen, this 28 milliseconds, and depending on network speak, you need to add another 20 milliseconds or so to that, and the asset loading, and the rendering, and the JavaScript execution time, that that's minimal. And that's kind of what BigPipe provides. Because when the page is ready and just there's some little customized content or some Im unimportant content to send, um, then you've already loaded all the CSS, all the J JavaScript, you've loaded already most of the page, you've rendered almost all of the page, and your JavaScript has executed. Um, we'll upload that later so you can take a look at the demo then again. Um, and if you pay close attention, you will see that the home button in the small pipe example is not turning white because the JavaScript is just executed when everything is done. But for the big pipe, uh, actually, it's very fast that you see that this is the active page because this is done in JavaScript. And um, as those of you that had been at the CDN talk yesterday saw, uh, these great caching capabilities even allow caching within CDNs. So how do you achieve that to make the whole web fast? That's very, very simple. Use static HTML pages, no CSS, no JavaScript, no images, just text and links. And then you have a fast site. So seriously, no, of course not. There is, however, some truth to that uh, that we have to see. And that is that performance optimization means to optimize to do as little work as possible and to use as little resources as possible. And so with, for the critical path, which is what you want the user to see, which in our example is the awesome blog post, is can we avoid doing the work at all? Or can we avoid doing the work during the critical path, for example, during some other operation, like doing saving? Um, or can we cache it even permanently? And if all that's not possible, maybe we can cache it temporarily, like for 10 seconds. Uh, you can't imagine what 10 seconds of um, data can make for a difference, that you're saying, well, it's OK, my content can be stale for 10 seconds. But if then there's 1,000 users that are trying to get the cache at that time, they're all getting the 10 second old data. That's not a big deal, um, unless you deal in real time stocks or something, where you got microsecond precision. Um, but in most cases, you can do some little kind of micro cache, and that can help a lot. But if you can't, then the new kind of thing is to defer executing it after the main content, and that's what Big Pipe, Small Pipe is all about. So remember this little uh, abbreviation, ACD, avoid cache defer. Um, if you're trying to build your applications in that uh, way, uh, you will definitely succeed in having fast operations and applications. So um, caching. Avoiding is pretty simple. Work you don't have to do, you don't have to do. But caching overall has problems because your content should be as current as possible, it should have a high cache ratio, and it should have low cache invalidation complexity. Um, but you choose two. You can't have R3. You need to choose two. And that's a little problem, because so far, for low complexity cache invalidation, one of the examples would be time-based invalidation. So for example, you cache the pages unconditionally for a year. The content is not really current, but cache ratio is obviously great. 
or you cache pages never, the content is always current, but the cache ratio is 0%. And that is unfortunately the way how many, many Drupal, 8, uh, Drupal 7 sites operate that way right now, and hopefully no Drupal 8 sites. And cache pages for, for example, six hours, the content is quite current and cache ratio is kind of acceptable. But after six hours, if you've got a storm of people coming in, you've got a problem. Um, then we have another example for low complexity cache invalidation. That's a clear all invalidation. So, whoa. Um, sorry. So whenever a page changes, clear the whole page cache. And that's actually how Drupal 7's page cache operates like this by default. It's like how it has worked in Drupal 5, in Drupal 6, and in Drupal 7. So whenever a page changes, the whole page cache is cleared, the block cache is cleared, and um, that is a possibility, but it's not a very good one. And in Drupal 7 Contrib, um, a possibility to do that is to clear only what has changed. So for example, with the expire and varnish module in Drupal 7, you need to purge, expire all the URLs that contain content from anything that was on the pages, and you need a way to track that. So um, example from the enterprise, you have a list of related articles, and it's on 100,000 pages. But now someone comes on and says, well, there's a misinformation there, and it's a big boss from the company that says that, and we need to immediately change that. And now the problem is you, of course, in this case, you would probably just clear all the cache, but in another scenario, um, you would need to figure out on which pages this wrong title was displayed, so that really you are immediately expiring all that things. And um, that is very, very, very difficult. And that has a high invalidation cost. Wim showed, a, um, showed yesterday from Akia Cloud Edge um, an example where it was kind of showing a progress bar, how, how it was gradually uh, clearing the CDN. So Drupal 8 shows high complexity. The content is invalidated instantaneously, it's cached permanently, and the solution are cache tags, as explained later. But there's more problems to caching because the content should be varied by user, a group, a special permission, the face of the moon. Um, yeah, use cases are there. Um, have high cache hit ratio and have low complexity. So the logic needed to ensure that the caches are granularly varied. Because you can obviously kind of take your page and then you go down into all objects, all nodes and everything and try to figure out what everything varies on and then you can obviously perfectly cache the page. Um, but that is very complex, very um, uh, performance expensive and would not really solve that. And again, you need to choose two. Um, you can't have all three. So either very good granularity or high cache at ratio but, or low complexity. What, again? No! Um, Drupal 8 shows high complexity. That means everything declares what it varies by. This allows caching authenticated user content securely. And actually at this point with dynamic, uh, dynamic page cache and core, which is activated by default uh, in the current Drupal 8 hat, if you're using Drupal, you're using dynamic page cache and you don't even see it. It's just transparently there. And uh, the solution are cache context, as explained later, and placeholders. So wait a moment. So what about KISS? KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid? Hmm? Counter question. Who of you uses a database? Huh? OK. I, I think I saw someone there using some flat HTML files. Um, databases are actually beasts of complexity. But you don't see any of that, and you still use them. You just give hints, like you give indexes and queries, how you build them, and the database does its magic. And uh, many no, is, no SQL folks have learned the hard way that all that magic that's in the database, they need to then integrate in their own apps. So databases are giving you a lot 
that you never see. And that's the same as Drupal 8. Drupal 8 makes it as simple as possible for you, for all of you. And that's a huge, huge opportunity because that means um, if we all build our sites right, we will all have fast Drupal 8 sites. They will be perfectly cacheable even in CDNs. Because Drupal 8 does all this caching logic, this cache redirect logic, this varying, this bubbling, it's all internally. You don't see any of that. You don't even need to understand it. You just need to understand that if you help Drupal 8, Drupal 8 will help you. So if you give Drupal the information, then it can be way, way smarter about this, its decisions. And when we last said this talk, uh, you could give that information, but Drupal was not smarter. Now it is smarter, and you will soon see why. So Drupal 8 formalizes those things in a kind of language to make your site fast. And um, this language we will show you in a moment. So um, Drupal 7 could theoretically use the same language once it's finalized in Drupal 8. There's a render cache 7x2 each branch. It's at the moment not active. Sorry, Drupal 8 took longer than expected. And um, I've also worked hard to get it done uh, thanks to Drupal 8 Accelerate. Um, but there's a service container module which allows to use the same code in Drupal 7 as in Drupal 8. And um, with that, I'm pretty, pretty positive that many of the code we've written together, we can just copy to Drupal 7 and directly use. But it's frozen at the moment. So how do I give this information? And that's what we'll, we'll show you now. Um, so, whoa, something happened there. I have no idea. There we go, okay. So the thought process of how we actually make Drupal fast because uh, Fabian was referring earlier to a language. Um, maybe that is a slightly too big of a word. There's a handful, three concepts that are really crucial, and if you understand those, you can tell Drupal what it needs to know in order to do these smart caching things automatically. So the thought process is all about dependencies. Because Drupal 7 and earlier versions and many other web frameworks and CMSs and so on do not know all dependencies. Without dependencies, we don't know what to vary by, when something is no longer uh, correct, when it's outdated, and so on. And so it's all about making sure that Drupal knows the dependencies. And Drupal 7 didn't track any dependencies, and a very good and clear example is Drupal add CSS and Drupal add JS. I'm sure most of you used this at some point, hands up in the air who did. Okay, you were all messing with global state, congratulations. Because this was what it was doing. We're calling this function, and it was putting data in some global state somewhere for the current page, but it had no way of knowing what piece of markup, which render array, which block, which entity, which whatever it was associated with. So we were building global state to know all of the assets that were associated with that page, which is great, but that meant we weren't able to cache individual parts of the page, and that is problematic. And that's what attached libraries, asset libraries, solve. So Whenever you have a render array, you specify pound attached, and this existed in Drupal 7 as well, but it was not enforced there. In Drupal 8, there is, this is the only way to attach metadata, which can be assets, which can be headers, which can be all sorts of things. But the important thing is we know the dependencies for a render array, as in the attached assets that they need in order to function correctly. So that's one example of a, of a dependency that was previously hidden and now explicit. Another really good example is a URL function. How many of you used that at some point? Also, the majority, that makes sense, because we're on a web CMS, right? So the URL's output, the URL function's output, I, I think this might frighten you, um, it depended on the front page configuration, the HTTPS configuration, the clean URL configuration, the current site and a multi-site, the current host name, and so many more things. And so really, what that meant was, you, you thought you were specifying some piece of input and you got some piece of output, and you would think that it only depended on that piece of input that you provided, but really it depended on all these other things. So it really also depended on global state. So it really was impossible to cache. Well, we could cache it still, but it would be impossible to invalidate correctly or to vary correctly. And yet many of us, probably all of us, did it anyway. And the reason we were able to get away with that is very simple. As Fabian has demonstrated earlier, we just cleared all the caches all the time, and that's not great. So in Drupal 8, 
this is kind of what solves that. This is the language that Fabian was referring to earlier. So we have three key concepts, cache tags, contexts, and max age. And cache tags are about capturing data dependencies. It, it allows you to specify that, for example, a render array or anything else that is computed depends on a certain bit of data. For example, um, maybe a render array is showing the title of a node, then you specify the cache tag for that node so that when it's rendered, we know that, hey, this piece of rendered markup, it actually depends on this node, and if this node is modified, this piece of rendered markup becomes invalid, it becomes stale, and this allows us to then track such a kind of dependency. Another um, aspect of this is cache contexts. Cache contexts allow us to uh, capture the variations, the request context dependencies. So for example, we may be showing the title of a node, but maybe that node is actually translated. It's available in 10 different languages. And if we were just specifying the cache tag, we wouldn't know that it was actually possible to have 10 different titles. We would always be reusing the same title. So both the Dutch version of the site, the English, the French, all of them would end up using the same one, the first one that just happened to be requested. That's also not great, of course. And cache contexts allow us to capture that angle of information. And finally, max age is about time dependencies because some information is not meant to be cached permanently. You cannot cache it forever because it is deeply intertwined with a certain period of time. So it's only valid for a very limited period of time. This was probably the one you will use the least. Um, it defaults to permanent, as in this thing doesn't really have a max age, it's permanently cacheable. But tags and contexts are the things that you will use uh, all the time because these are the things that are happening all the time. And what's also absolutely crucial is that, for example, that render array that shows the title of the node, that is only part of a bigger, bigger thing, the page. Or maybe it's part of a block, and the block is part of a region, and the region is part of the page. And so all of that cacheability metadata in the various parts of what is being rendered all bubble to the top level. So the contents of a block, the cacheability metadata for those contexts bubble to the block level, that bubbles to the region level, that bubbles to the page level, that bubbles to the response level. And the fact that we therefore know comprehensively every dependency for that response and for every part of the page, because overall, a render array is nothing more than a tree representation that matches the tree representation of the DOM to, so ex to some extent. There we also have JavaScript event bubbling. bubbling. This is exactly like that. So this allows us to know comprehensively for a response all of its dependencies, which things it varies by, which things, which data it actually depends on, and how long that page can be cached. So that, that's the theory bit, and uh, that's hopefully kind of clear, but how to put that into practice? And there is just a simple series of steps that you should follow, and then it, it would be very easy to uh, automatically have all the cacheability metadata that is necessary. So first of all, you have to realize that you are rendering something. Uh, it's just creating a render array and forgetting about the cacheability, that is a problem. You have to realize I'm creating a render array, I'm creating some output that will need to vary, that needs to be uh, current at all times, so it needs to be invalidated when the data depends upon changes. So think of the fact that you have to think of cacheability in the first place. The next question is, is this thing something worth caching on its own? Is it expensive to render? If the answer is yes, use cache keys, just like in Drupal 7. There's nothing new there. If you've used render caching in Drupal 7, show of hands who has. I'm fearing the number is going to be low. Yeah, about 5% or so maybe. Um, so this actually already existed in Drupal 7, this small part. Uh, it allowed you to cache things, um, a, a certain subtree of the overall render array structure of the entire page. And this is what causes that subtree to be cached individually on its own so that it doesn't have to be regenerated on each page load. So that's cache keys. The next thing is capturing variations. Does the thing I'm rendering vary by the permissions for the current user, by the URL, the negotiated interface language, or maybe by something else. You can specify your own custom cache context. Maybe your website is, uh, is tailored to every country that your visitor may be from, um, and therefore you would want a country cache context. Maybe you have a weekly deal um, 
a weekly deal kind of thing because you're an e-commerce site. Then you can vary by that. You can specify any cache context needed for your specific use cases. Drupal Core ships with um, the ones that Drupal Core needs, but you can specify your own. And so when there is some kind of variation going on, you specify the cache contexts. And that looks somewhat like that. And this should hopefully remind you of the HTTP very header because that is very, very similar. The HTTP very header allows you to specify that you vary by certain aspects. These are aspects that are deeply internal to Drupal. We, we cannot really expose at the HTTP level the current user permissions and so on. That's a Drupal specific concept, but this is kind of the very header inside Drupal at more granular levels. And then is there something in my render array that I depend on that may cause the render array that I generated to become outdated? So a data dependency. If the answer to that is yes, then specify cache tags. And every single entity, every bit of configuration, and all of the other most common things in Drupal 8 automatically have cache tags and are therefore, um, you, you don't have to specify all of these things by hand because it can give you those things. This is just a clear, concise example. So for example, this render rate depends on node 5, user 3, and taxonomy term 23. So it's just a string-based syntax, very simple. And finally, so we've had keys, contexts, max a uh, tags, and now max age, because sometimes the render array does become outdated automatically after some period of time. So in that case, specify a max age, which is a number of seconds or you can choose to specify permanent, which is a default, which means that it's cacheable forever. So it's only going to be invalidated if there are cache tags associated with it. So for example, a no tile is not going to change after some period of time, right? It's only going to change if you actually change that node. So there is no need to specify a max age in a number of seconds. It's fine to keep the default it's permanently cacheable just until the node changes, then it becomes invalidated. So we only need a cache tag for that particular example. And that obviously is super, super um, similar to the cache control header in HTTP, who, which has a max age property. It's exactly like that. And as I previously briefly mentioned, uh, all objects in Drupal core automatically provide cacheability metadata. So we have an interface that provides, that allows you to get the inherent metadata for that particular object. And this is implemented and thus provided for just about everything that you use on a daily basis. So for configuration, all configuration, all entities, both content and config entities, every access result, because access results can often be very expensive to compute, um, but very often they're also very cacheable. Per, per permission caching, for example, per permission access checking, for example, that is perfectly cacheable. All sorts of things, including block plugins, context plugins, condition plugins, and many things you probably are rarely going to touch, they all provide cacheability metadata. And that's necessary, because without, if, if there is a gap, then we don't know about a certain dependency, and we cannot ensure that everything keeps working correctly. We need to know the dependencies. To make it a bit easier to deal with that, so that you don't have to specify um, pound cache, max h, and so on uh, explicitly in every damn render array, um, we have an API to make that much easier. You specify the render array you want to add a cacheable dependency to, as in the render array depends on something that is cacheable, and you pass the dependency. So for example, the node object. So here is a concrete example. We're talking to uh, the configuration system. We're getting the, the piece of configuration that contains the site name, and we're creating a render array that says, um, welcome to the site. And the, we then use this function to specify and pass in both the render array and the config objects, and then the render array gets the necessary dependency information automatically. So in, if Drupal pages were kind of like ships, because Drupal rendering a page is kind of like building a ship in the sense that you have this massive thing called a page, because let's, let's be honest, it consists of so many small parts in Drupal. Um, so if it were like building a ship, then in Drupal 8, it kind of looks like this. The dependencies, I've said that word how many times now? Uh, the dependencies are very clear. The components are very clear. So we know very much how a ship is built, how a page is rendered. In Drupal 7, it is still a ship. We still are building pages, but it's all coming from everywhere. We're calling into global state all the time, but it's still is assembling pages. In Drupal 8, thanks to the better structure, we are able to do things we weren't able to do before. 
So all those dependencies were really great, and they're giving us a lot of information, but there was one remaining problem. Uh, we had this dynamic page cache, and then there were things on the page that were uncacheable, or things on the page, like the toolbar, that were varying by the current user. And that was overall making our cache problematic, because um, as we'll see in a moment, um, too much cache variation is a problem. So the remaining problem we faced was that with all those dependencies, the cacheability was not good. And the things were slower than they could be. Oh. So why? That's the question. And the answer is um, pages are static and dynamic in its nature. There's usually some sp static content um, that is used. And um, there's some dynamic blocks, like one dynamic block, another dynamic block, a dynamic comment form, like that big pipe example you've seen in the beginning. And the problem is those dynamic parts are slowing the whole page down. But on the other hand, those dynamic parts are in the web 3.0 uh, what is providing value to, the si to your site. Um, it is now about personalized experiences. It is about giving nice things um, to your user that is dynamic, that is giving them a great experience. And with all that, um, we cannot just um, remove that. But that is what's making the pages slow and uncacheable. And uncacheable, it makes them because if you have 100,000 pages and you have 100 users, then you have 10 million combinations with a very bad cache hit ratio because every user just has that page for himself cached. There's no reusability at all. And that's what we had first when we had dynamic page cache, ACA called smart cache before, um, in the beginning stages. So how do we solve that? We just make the pages less dynamic, problem solved. Uh, no. Uh, fortunately, Drupal 8 has a solution for that. And it is already in core. That is very, very important. It's placeholders and auto placeholdering. So no more of this, but instead what we are seeing, this. Drupal 8, due to all those dependencies you've provided, is knowing your page. You have a shopping cart, which is user cached. You have a normal block, which is just cached by the user permissions. And you have your content, which is user permissions and URL cached. That means, obviously, on every different article, uh, you have different URLs, so it's differing by URL. But that normal block we are seeing there, um, it's user permissions cached, and we can directly cache it with the rest because it doesn't matter if it's also cached by URL redundantly. But that shopping cart, we can't. And um, that's a problem. But Drupal 8 now just makes one little thing, it placeholders it. And with that little trick uh, to make your sites faster, uh, one little trick, you know, um, you have that placeholder, and this is what is allowing all of that. So this is how it looks like to Drupal, um, just to give you the full picture. There's all of those placeholders on the page, the HTML head placeholder, CSS placeholder, JavaScript placeholder, bottom placeholder, because all those other placeholders could still have JavaScript, CSS, whatever in there, and you have the static content which is cacheable now. But um, this is already huge, because if your pages are simple, Drupal can perfectly cache them. And if there's something complex, Drupal will automatically throw it out. Or you can even customize as we will show later. So, and that's all stored in, in attached as independent lazy builders. So you see on the right-hand side, uh, independent lazy builders. And that's the next thing. Lazy builders, what are those things? We've never heard of those before. Well, this is what it looks like. It's kind of like a pre-render function. How many of you have? Heard of pre-render? How many have uh, used pre-render? Yeah, okay, about 10%, I guess. Lazy Builder is um, kind of the successor to that in the sense that Lazy Builder is a more demanding, more uh, specific version of that. Uh, this is what it looks like. You can specify only one Lazy Builder for a given subtree because whenever you specify a level like this complex underscore thing, that's a new subtree for the render array structure. You specify a callback, which is going to render the thing, which is going to lazily build the thing, hence the name, and you can pass in some arguments. 
but it's heavily restricted, as we will see in a second. So for example, the comment form that we all know and then that Fabian also demoed in the very beginning is rendered using a lazy builder. That's why that comment form was actually also rendered or was possible to send that via BigPipe. So we specify a callback and you pass in a number of arguments, the things necessary to render that comment form in the first place. This should also be very familiar and similar to what you're already doing, but as I said, it's very restricted. So a lazy builder's callback context, so the arguments that you pass into it, may only contain scalar values or null. So no objects, and that allows us to easily cache uh, that information so that we can easily pass it around, so that we can cache the information to build this thing lazily. So no objects. Also, um, no children can exist. So remember, this is an entire subtree. So if the lazy builder is next to something that is also a render array, that means that we, it's a conflict. There is no way to know where it should appear then. So whenever you specify a lazy builder, nothing else can exist because we want to be able to render the entire subtree lazily. And so also in that way, it is heavily restricted. And the cool thing is then that a lazy builder callback is a thing that builds the render array for that subtree and returns it. And the output must solely depend on the input, the arguments that are given. And these restrictions together is what allows us to be able to render those things in isolation. And that's what allows BigPipe, that's what allows ESI rendering, and so on. And so Facebook, uh, Facebook, Fabian, that's a strange. <laughs> Sorry, Fabian. <laughs> uh, Fabian also mentioned auto placeholdering. So we, we encountered the lazy builder thing just now, and that's, allow, that's what allows us to pull something out and render it later because we have the arguments, which are just scalar values, and that allows us to cache it, which allows us to defer rendering it. Remember the adage that Fabian just used, avoid, defer, avoid cache defer. So we, we want to defer in some cases. And, other placeholdering is what allows us to defer the rendering of something to a later time. However, it's also configurable. So this is what you will see in a, a, a services YAML file, the auto placeholder conditions. And we see the three things that we're already familiar with, max h, context, and tags. And by default, as soon as Drupal encounters a max h zero on a render array that has a lazy builder, it says, oh, this is way too dynamic. I'm not going to render this. I'm going to defer this. So maxh0 triggers it being deferred, triggers it being placeholder so that can be rendered later. And the two other th conditions are session and context, session and user cache context. So as soon as something is varying by session, which is, as we all know, very dynamic, we chose to also defer the rendering. If something varies by user, we also choose de to defer the rendering. But note that this is configurable. If your site is for a very specific use case, and you know it very well, you can choose, for example, to uh, omit the user in these settings. So that would allow you to cache uh, per user anyway, because maybe your use case only has 10 different users, many people logging in on the same user. I don't know. It's totally customizable and, com customizable and configurable to suit your needs. But these should be very solid defaults. So that's auto placeholdering at a conceptual level, but let's make it a little bit more concrete. So going back to the comment form uh, example that was using a lazy builder, I've omitted the arguments for now to make it a bit more legible. So let's assume that the user cache context is specified on there, or that it was bubbled up automatically from um, the contents of the, the render array that will be returned by the lazy builder later. So let's assume it is varying by user. That means the pl auto placeholdering conditions are met. And that means that what Drupal does is it specifies create placeholder arrow true. And so just setting that flag means that Drupal will turn this thing into a placeholder so that it will be deferred later. But note that this is nothing uh, guarded off, not something you, can, you cannot do. So if you know your specific use case very well and you think it should always be placeholder, then you have the complete liberty to just specify create placeholder true yourself and it will always be placeholder. Or you can specify false to avoid it ever being placeholder, not even when it meets the auto placeholdering conditions. So once the placeholder uh, create placeholder true flag is there, during the rendering process, Drupal will pull out that information, the deferring is what we're seeing now. We will pull out the lazy builder and the cache property, 
and instead put in a piece of markup over there, tuple render placeholder callback equals something something. It's just um, the markup could be completely arbitrary. It could even be a random number if you wish. But this just helps in uh, making the debugging process easier because when you encounter a placeholder, it's just not just this bit of gibberish. It is something you can actually understand to find your way to figure out, oh, this thing, it will be replaced at a later time. It was deferred. And so we have a piece of markup instead. We have an attachment, as, as Fabian mentioned earlier, the independent lazy builders. So in the placeholders render array, in the placeholders in pound attached over there, you see that the key is the markup for the placeholder. It could also be a random string, as I mentioned. It's just it matches uh, with this. So these, thing, these two things match. And then finally, what it's going to be replaced with is in here. So these two match as well. And this level, as in uh, the fact that there is no placeholder markup and the original render array is in here, means that we are deferring it to a later time. And that allows for the really, really interesting things because you can defer it to different stages and you can defer it to different places even depending on your infrastructure. And Fabian will show you that now. Yep. Just to keep here at just one more moment, um, the trick we are using here is um, because we have those lazy builders, that's not much. We can just take um, this placeholder, we put it in a key value store and then ESI is implemented. You can implement ESI as I've shown yesterday in generally less than 20 lines of code and have it working. Um, so the placeholder render strategies is something which allows you to totally customize all of that. Uh, that's what BigPipe uses, the ESI from the demo yesterday uses, um, and um, it's very simple. We have a chain placeholder strategy as kind of the default strategy, but you could also override that in your container file. And um, chain placeholder strategy just means every strategy gets a chance to replace placeholders. And if they're not replacing them, it just goes on. And then there's a default strategy, which is kind of our fallback or default, and which just means um, it returns all placeholders as is. They should be rendered directly. There was kind of, this is now matching with what you've seen at the very beginning of the talk when I said we're using this single flush strategy. And this is kind of big pipe. There's almost, except the JavaScript library plus an emitter, that is sending the data in chunked uh, things and storing the original placeholder somewhere else, uh, there's almost nothing more to that uh, from a strategy perspective. And you could now have your custom strategy and with your custom strategy, you can say, well, if it's this block, then I wanna do this or I wanna use some sta stale content. Like you could decide, well, I know this block is cached and I will always deliver some stale content from that block. Um, until that delivery. Or you could say, well, here I want to use a React widget or something. And you can dynamically do that, even if the site's already built. Because Drupal will tell you, well, those are the dynamic parts and that's. Theoretically, we could even build a graphical user interface if anyone want to volunteer on that, um, where you could kind of have like Drupal tell you, well, I've seen all of those placeholders in the last a few times and you can configure, oh, I need this library up front. This will always be cached by user. I need an additional context or I always want to small pipe this, small pipe this, big pipe this, but I want to block the page rendering on this because that's really screwing up and making the page a little chunky or something. So, but yeah, that's placeholder strategies. So one final bit, a few pitfalls and scenarios. Um, to help you get uh, to help you get a slightly better understanding, so we saw a bit a bit a small example earlier where we're using the site name. The site that name is in some piece of configuration. So when you're using some configuration, don't forget to edit cache tags. But you don't have to do it manually. You can reuse that uh, handy helper function. When you're depending on an entity, don't forget to add its cache tags. When you're depending on a field of an entity, don't forget the ad to add the entity's cache tags. The field is part of the entity, so the entity's cache tags are what matters. When you have uncacheable data, don't forget to set max h to zero, which signals Drupal this is not ever cacheable. It cannot be cached, period. And then, 
yeah, or if you're manually rendering a link, then you could either use Twig, um, that's very simple, or um, you could use a render array, um, and that's the best way to do that. Um, and then we have like a little scenario um, where you vary by cookie, um, which means that, for example, you have the username in a cookie, and you want to vary by that, you can just specify cache context cookies username, and that's it. It will correctly vary. Um, and for example, the scenario would there be to always vary by a device cookie that you've added for mobile uh, different things that was huge before uh, responsive came in, but still used by some side. So then you just add it to the required cache context, the device cookie, and everything on the page will by vary by that. This is also important if you have security sensitive information, like you have a special group in your department, whatever you, you need to vary on, you create a cache context, add it to the required cache context, you can be sure that everything varies correctly. And that's it, I hope we li you liked it. Any questions? question about stampede protection would you implement that in a placeholder strategy or um... Um, there's two ways where stampede protection could now be implemented um, I've played around a little bit with that yesterday um, after our talk um, and um, one is directly in the renderer um, where you can um, have the renderer is now a class so you could override it and then you could do that but um, in this example um, yes, you could actually say um, these are the hard parts. I want to stampede protect it. So you could have like a special strategy that would protect your content and, for example, even deliver outdated content. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> about the, the strategies, um, there's the, the, the default Drupal strategy, which I can't understand. It actually builds the page. Uh, Place, uh, replacing the placeholders uh, before delivering the page. And there's big pipe that uses JavaScript, I guess. Small pipe, what, what does that do, actually? Small pipe is sending the content chunk. So you have to imagine um, you have a DOME document, like an HTML document. You usually have like um, sections where you have a main section and then you have a sidebar. While on the screen you are seeing it like this, you have here the main section and here the sidebar. In the DOM it's actually like this. So what we are doing with small pipe is we are sending everything up to the first placeholder because all that content we know already perfectly. So we are sending that, we render the placeholder, just print it out, flush again, send the next parts of the page. So. Um, this is very useful, and it's also so. But this depends on the DOM order. So if you have something in the sidebar that obviously wouldn't appear until all the placeholders in the main content have been sent, that is by design because. Um, but it doesn't need JavaScript. That's a big advantage. Very big, yeah. In um, your code example, when something was dependent on configuration, like the site name, you showed that you just pass the whole configuration object. Now, a configuration object can contain a lot of things, like um, the front page or you know, a custom configuration object with 15 different things. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it kind of annoying that all of your caches are cleared when, for instance, you're changing your front page and not your site name, and you have like 20 blocks dependent on the site name? Um, so the reason it works that way is because the configuration is stored at those levels. So the answer to avoid that problem would be to make the configuration more granular so that the site name and the front page setting are stored in separate things. But as long as it is changing as one whole, so for example, one bit of configuration contains both the site name and the front page setting, as long as those are safe together, there is no way we can possibly distinguish between what is actually being changed. It is just being changed, and that's all we know at that level. So there is no other way than making it more granular at the config level. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, 
Hi. Um, the beginning, uh, sorry for my English, it's not perfect. I'm going to try to explain the question as best as I, as I can. Perfectly uh, understandable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, a few weeks ago in my company we have uh, that uh, a little bit discussion about uh, cash. And the thing is, uh, in order you can use cash everywhere around the Drupal, uh, in your opinion, uh, the best way, um, w what is the best way? Use the Drupal cash or cash uh, your, yourself. So uh, I'm going to explain in, in, in with, uh, with an example. For example, if you need a teaser uh, information note and you, and you know that Drupal uh, it cached already, uh, what's the best way? Use the what the Drupal cache or um, use your own cache? Sure. Um, so you have to understand that within, I assume this is Drupal 7, within Drupal 7, um, there's, you could, um, there's actually only two real caches in core, and the one is a page cache, which you can use, but which has a problem that it, in, it gets invalidated very frequently when new content is added. And then there is the um, filter cache, which means uh, everything that is displayed is kind of um, filtered from the format. Um, there's some other caches for menu entries, etc., like that. Mm -hmm. And blocks, and there's block cache, yes, for sure. And But um, that's kind of it. Um, what I would advise you is um, I've developed that, so um, shameless plug. But anyway, that render cache in version 1.0 even, it's used on Drupal.org um, for sh rendering the comments. And entity comment caching or entity render caching is already possible in Drupal 7. And that's probably the best way to, um, uh, to do caching. What you could do also is to use entity cache. That's a very stable contrib solution. Uh, that you would do. I would always first see what do panels, views, render cache, etc. the whole contrib space provide before I would do my own caching because um, it's usually that they have solved some problems already uh, that you didn't think about. Thank you. And one small addition to that, uh, it is very important to stress that Drupal 7 does not have all the dependency information, so no cache tags, context, and so on. So it is absolutely crucial that you then very, very thoroughly analyze the information that you're caching with the render cache module. Mm. Because on Drupal.org, for example, one tiny bit was forgotten, the time zone. And so the first person to visit a Drupal.org page, the time zone for that user showed up for all users, which could lead to very confusing situations. Mm. So that is the downside. You have to think of everything still. Any more questions? Doesn't look like it. Then thank you very much and have a great Drupal con.